Hey guys, welcome to my video on parallel processing. We're gonna use the for each and do parallel packages to speed up big loops in R. Uh, a little bit of background without getting too technical because your computer probably has multiple processors in it, multiple brains, so to speak, but it usually doesn't use them all. And in R and in other languages, if you're going to be doing a long repetitive process, it can be very helpful to get more of those brains involved to work through it faster. So we're gonna use the for each and do parallel packages. And then we'll also visualize some of our results in ggplot too. Now let's set up our back end. First thing I wanna do is I want to know how many cores are in my computer. So I'm gonna use my detect cores function. And I have eight cores, eight processors, eight brains in this computer. So I can use those. Uh, next step is I set up a cluster, which is going to be grouping all these cores together, but I am not going to use all eight of my cores. Cause if I do, my computer won't be able to do anything else. It won't be able to answer an email or do anything without cutting in on these, this cluster I've created. So it is common practice to take the number of cores you have and then subtract one from it, or maybe two or whatever, depends on what else you're doing. Uh, but that saves some brain power to let your computer function in other ways. And that is basically just not to let your computer get overloaded. And then we set it up. I'm gonna register, do parallel on that object cluster, that the CL that I just created. So if I run these three lines, I am setting up my computer to have seven cores working together. Now, uh, now we need to run it on something. And I told you this usually works in large repetitive thing in large repetitive processes loops. Uh, so I'm going to do a small loop. Let's do a thousand observations and I'm gonna do a really simple calculation. I'm just going to square each number from one to a thousand and just see how long it takes. Uh, and the way it's going to work is I'm going to use the for each package, the for each function which is going to store my output in a list. And so you have to go back and access it all from the list later. You can learn how to do lists elsewhere. Here, I'm assuming you already know how to do it. So I'm gonna start with a blank list and then say big list is equal to for each. Now you're gonna notice that the syntax within for each are a lot like a normal for loop i equals one to n um, and then where you would normally enter a squiggly bracket i'm going to insert one more piece which is what really makes it stand out this do this percentage do par percentage now whatever i type inside these brackets it can be a simple loop or it can be something big and complicated but as long as my loop repeats through the same thing over and over and over I can run it on seven cores and it should go faster. Could go faster. It kind of depends on what we're doing here. Uh, mine is very simple. I'm doing big list item i is equal to i squared. And then at the end of that, you want to stop your cluster. Otherwise, uh, it keeps some all that processing power tied up and it can't do anything anywhere else. And you might get some errors. So let's see, the last thing I ran was that. I forgot to run these along the way, create my empty list, populate the list. Now let's take a look at our list real quick. Oops, I forgot to tell it what cluster to stop. Stop the CL cluster. There we go. Now let's take a look at our list real quick. Um, I've got a thousand elements in it and each one just shows the square of whatever I it was with so it just did a thousand calculations and stored them later I can go back now again in practice a loop like this probably isn't worth 
doing a lot of parallel computing. But if you have large functions or analysis going inside those squiggle brackets, this can be very helpful. Now, I have here an example, and this is the code that you're gonna have access to on GitHub, where, okay, so the first part, I just did all the same things. The second part, I'm actually gonna put do a function, and we're gonna do some simulations based on how many cores we use and how long our loop goes for. And I'm also gonna insert a timer in this loop just to test it out. Okay, so I'm still gonna cluster, but my cluster is gonna be based on whatever my function says. Uh, I'm still gonna create this list. The list goes from one to whatever nvec was. It creates this big list, stops cluster, checks how long it takes to start the cluster, run the loop, stop the cluster. And I'm gonna save those times. Let's see, I'm gonna store the results in a data frame. And I ran it, it took a couple of days, but by increments of 10,000, from 10,000 to a million for the length of the vector. And I did it on one core, three cores, five cores, seven cores. Right. So this code is all available to you. You can check it out. I'm just not planning to run it for the video because I ran it over the weekend. Uh, yeah, I didn't feel like sitting through that. It took a couple days because my computer is kind of old. Uh, and then basically I just stored all the results. Now I did a clunky way of adjusting my seconds to minutes. You'll have to forgive me for that. This is about parallel computing and I was just being lazy. I wanted to make this video instead of waiting another week for it. Uh, but I saved my results. And here I pulled up the results that ran over the weekend. Now, I'm gonna plot them. Let's plot the first 50,000. So this is the first five lengths of the loop, 10,000 calculations, 20,000 calculations, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000. And each one, we're just doing the squaring of it. Uh, and let's see what that looked like. And here we've got our plot, which looks something like this. And I've got my number of cores by color. And we see that one core consistently takes the most time. And then there's three cores in green, five cores in blue, and seven cores in seven or in purple. Now, something that's interesting is that seven cores is usually slower than three and five cores. And so I need to get real with you for a second about why that might be. There's a few reasons why more cores isn't always better. One is overhead that uh, sometimes it just takes, the computer takes some of its processing powers to manage the the information flowing from all the different cores. And so it might be using a meaningful amount of processing power just to gather all the cores. And that in some cases might mean fewer cores actually gets more work done. Uh, another is memory usage, not a problem in this case, uh, but if you're running really big stuff, the multiple cores might overwhelm the RAM on your computer. Uh, another is sharing resources. When I get to the big graph, I'll show you a picture of what that might look like. Uh, but yeah, if you share resources, like if you're using your computer for other things while this is running, uh, using too many cores might slow you down as your computer is competing for scarce resources. Uh, so, you know, sometimes more cores isn't always better. Uh, let me go back to the code though. Let me run a different version of this graph. Let's run one. Let's run one that has all 1 million calculations happening. And it looks something like this. Again, we see that the red, the one core scenario is always the slowest, but we see that three, five, and seven, none of them really outperforms the other one consistently. And that's because probably my loop's just too simple 
And we get to that overhead thing where managing the multiple cores makes it so it's not even really that much worth it to have all the extra cores. This would likely not be true if I was doing some complex analysis within that loop. But you can also see the part where I logged back onto my computer and started using it for other things and it really slowed down my code. Uh, and then I got off. But anyway, I thought it was kind of interesting. Uh, so I'm going to have all that code posted for you. Uh, but the for each loop is really easy. You add that do par clause to it. And other than that, it basically functions like a regular loop. And you can use it to utilize all your cores. But again, more is not always better, right? If I was looking at this graph, and I have a scarce amount of resources, or if I'm on some cloud platform and I have to pay for how many cores I'm using, I would probably say, you know what? Using three is just as good as seven or five. I'm gonna pay less and use three cores for this particular thing. Um, yeah, that'll change depending on what you put in your loop, but this loop was super easy. So guys, I hope that's helpful. If not, too bad. But thanks for watching. Good luck and see you later.